So we've known for decades that emissions are rising in the atmosphere because we can see them swirling up around there. So the famous Keeling curve is based on what we can actually see from space. But what you can't easily see from space is how did they get there? It still boggles my mind, but even in the year 2021, in most countries and most sectors of the economy, our process for actually answering where are all those emissions coming from is still to ask polluters how much they polluted, <laughs> just kind of like hope nothing is missing in that inventory, and then add up all those numbers, sometimes manually on paper. It's actually it's amazing that every single country in the world has agreed to this process. It's one of the great uh, things that brings me hope that everyone in the world is essentially contributing to this process. But it is such a stopgap solution. If we're really, really serious about stopping climate change, you can only manage what you can measure, and we need to have more information. We need to have information not like letting it take years to compile manual reports. I mean, there are countries that haven't had an emissions inventory in 20 years. What are you actually supposed to do with information that old? We need to not just be looking at what are the emissions of entire countries, because if you want to know how to reduce them, you need to know, right, do I need to go after the cars? Do I need to go after factories? What in my country is driving all these emissions? You see, camels are one of the only animals in the world that store all their fat in one spot. And that's useful for keeping cool in a hot climate because heat can escape faster from the rest of their body, which helps them maintain a lower body temperature. Compare that to other mammals like humans who store fat all over, making it a lot harder to stay cool. Today, camels still use the fat in their humps as a food reserve, but they're not the only ones. In extreme circumstances, the Turkana tribe in Kenya, for example, will eat camel fat to survive. They suffer a lot from periods of extreme drought. And I have seen these people, they've been very, very short of food. And this is difficult to believe, but it's true. Slit open the top of a camel's hump, take out the fat for their own consumption, and then put the top of the hump back on again. But don't worry. The camel makes a full recovery and instances are rare. But this practice has started to generate some buzz around camel fat as a new superfood. Turns out camel fat is loaded with fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals.
I bet all of you are familiar with this view of the ocean. But the thing is, most of the ocean looks nothing like this. Below the sunlit surface waters, there's an otherworldly realm known as the Twilight Zone. At 200 to 1,000 meters below the surface, sunlight is barely a glimmer. Tiny particles swirl down through the darkness, while flashes of bioluminescence give us a clue that these waters teem with life. Microbes, plankton, fish, everything that lives here has amazing adaptations for the challenges of such an extreme environment. These animals help support top predators such as whales, tuna, swordfish, and sharks. There could be 10 times more fish biomass here than previously thought. In fact, maybe more than all the rest of the ocean combined. There are countless undiscovered species in deep waters, and life in the Twilight Zone is intertwined with Earth's climate. Yet the Twilight Zone is virtually unexplored, there are so many things we still don't know about it. There is a lot of water on Mars and there once was a lot of surface flowing water. You don't see it because most of it is mixed with the soil which we call regolith on Mars, so the Martian soil can be anywhere from as little as 1% in some very dry desert. Like areas to as much as 60% water. So, one strategy for getting water when you're on Mars is to break up the regolith which would take something like a jackhammer because it's very cold, it's very frozen. If you can imagine making a frozen brick or a chunk of ice that's mostly soil and maybe half water and half soil that's what you would be dealing with. So, you need to break this up. Put it in an oven. As it heats up it turns to steam. You run it through a distillation tube and you have pure drinking water that comes out the other end. There is a much easier way to get water on Mars. In this country we have developed industrial dehumidifiers and they're very simple machines that simply blow the air in a room or a building across a mineral called zeolite zeolite is very common on earth it's very common on mars and zeolite is kind of like a sponge it absorbs water like crazy takes the humidity right out of the air then you squeeze it and out comes the water
In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, uh, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously, something had to be done. And in 1956, a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. This addressed the pollution from factories and the smog soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it. It's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries. And although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains and planes than in the 1950s. And this is now the main source of air pollution around the world. Thirdly, life from non-living matter. And this illustration often used is the one of the monkeys at the typewriter. Okay, so we have a monkey sitting at a typewriter. And the claim here is, basically, if you leave chance and time long enough, you will get life. Don't worry about it. Yes, it's strange. Yes, it's wonderful. But leave enough matter, 600 million years on Earth, and you will have life. So the monkey sitting at the typewriter, and the chances are, eventually, he produces the complete works of Shakespeare. So what's the problem? So there's no problem, there isn't an issue, right? You just leave him long enough, you'll be fine. And at one keystroke a second, the monkey might well eventually get to the complete works of Shakespeare, but he doesn't manage to do it in 600 million years. So what I decided to do to run the numbers is I, instead of saying type the complete works of Shakespeare, I just ran the numbers for how long would it take a monkey typing at one keystroke a second to type to be or not to be, that is the question, right? On average, how long is it going to take my monkey friend at one keystroke a second? I don't know how long you think that would be, maybe you could have a guess. Would it be less or more than 600 million years, which is the period life on Earth is supposed to have emerged within? And when I ran the numbers, to be or not to be, that is the question, takes 12.6 trillion, 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 trillion years to type just that phrase. And a DNA string, which you have to have for like the life we have now, doesn't emerge in, it's, it's not like, a sentence's worth of information. A DNA string has got as much information as the Encyclopedia Britannica. Right? So if we're saying that emerged, something of that complexity emerged by chance, undirected, within 600 million years, again, it's mathematically possible, but it's so incredibly unlikely that it would have that it tilts me in favour of the Christian story in which God creating life is simply a question of saying, let there be, and there was.
we'll do a demonstration to illustrate the difference between the thermodynamic control and the kinetic control of the product of a reaction. We'll put a 0.05 molar solution of mercury 2 chloride in a beaker. We will add some 0.1 molar potassium iodide. We notice the formation of a reddish orange solid. This solid is the product of thermodynamic control. It is the more stable product. We will now mix dilute solutions of mercury 2 chloride and potassium iodide. We see the formation of a yellow solid. This is the product of kinetic control. It is not the more stable product. Over time, the yellow product will undergo the reverse reaction and then eventually form the more stable product. The solution turns orange. This is the first ocean deployment of two new high-precision instruments designed to monitor the Earth's signals from the seafloor. This housing contains the tilt meter and nanobottom pressure recorder and the associated electronics and cabling used for power and communications. The instruments were deployed on the seafloor by a remotely operated vehicle as part of the Mars Seafloor Observatory test bed located at a depth of 3,000 feet in Monterey Bay. In this first test deployment in the ocean, they have already detected the ground motion from several large earthquakes, as far from the Mars site as Chile and the Mariana Trench. In the future, the instruments will be part of a global network of cabled seafloor observatories. Because of their precision, these two new instruments are already detecting signals which could never be measured before. Joseph Lister was an English surgeon who was the first man to realise the importance of aseptic techniques during surgical procedures. Lister was born in Essex, England, and after obtaining a Bachelor of Arts degree from University College London, he qualified as a doctor in 1852. Lister became assistant surgeon at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary and was later made surgeon at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary in Scotland. The accepted belief at the time was that contact of an open wound with moisture in the air caused infection, so surgical wounds were covered after operating with non-sterile cloths, which increased the risk of infection. Lister refused to accept this theory, and after reading the works of Louis Pasteur, he tried to prevent bacterial infection of surgical wounds by applying pure carbolic acid to surgical dressings, as well as cleaning wounds with the acid during and after surgery. Lister studied the effects of his treatment for two years and then published his findings. This led to the adoption of doctors wearing white gowns, which were used to show dirt, and using surgical gauze and carbolic acid to clean wounds after surgery. 
Lister successfully treated Queen Victoria using his new methods, and he was appointed Chairman of Clinical Surgery at King's College Hospital London, where he continued his research into antiseptics and clean surgery until he retired in 1893, and died in Kent, England, aged 85.